Hello, everyone. Glad to have you here again for our for our 55th uh, webinar in our series. And uh, the, the last few, we have done some either deeply technical um, webinars or math channels. And and uh, and and contrary to what you might think, you know, some we, we do have a bit of a plan on how we try to put these together. And this one and the and the and the next couple coming up are going to be a little bit more kind of back to the basics. Let's talk about some of the stuff you run into every day and uh, and and looking forward to, to doing some of those and, and as well as some of the more advanced ones, some different forms of motorsports are coming up, you know, things like that. But uh, wanted to get back and do kind of a, a nuts and bolts, uh, one of these, to, you know, hey, tips and tricks on how to how to make something that you you probably already have and make it work better. So look, been looking forward to this one as well. So. So let's start off with uh, just a, a quick introduction of our co-host. We've got we've got Peter Krause here. This is his fifth time coming on here and helping us, and I appreciate that very much, Peter. The um, you know fifth time you've been here on our on our Learn Fast webinar series. The uh, Peter Peter is based out of his uh, his home track of, of VIR in Virginia. Um, been a long time you know, AIM dealer, uh, sells and works with a, a lot of different products. And uh, so he has a really deep knowledge of, of these kind of things. And um, the, tell, us, tell us, Peter, just a little bit about, uh, you know, how you got here, maybe a little bit about uh, what you think we want to cover a little bit today, and then we'll uh, we'll start the process and, and jump in. That's great, Roger. Um, you know, one of the great about this whole thing is technology tools, that help people go quicker. It is very important uh, to put numbers to subjective. I was a professional mechanic for 25 years. I've been racing in SCCA and historic racing. Ooh, Peter, uh, Peter locked up at least on my end. Hopefully, uh, uh, yeah. voice is just a little bit. Peter, I don't know if you have an opportunity, if you can do it live, uh, to to maybe turn down your your video quality. Yeah, maybe. Me, uh, yeah, go it, ahead and do uh, that. It, uh, while he's doing that, we early on we've we've had some trouble with technology. You know, this is a. Uh, uh, you know what, what happens, especially when a lot of people are doing this. Almost every time, even even if we didn't change anything, it gets better as we go through the through the webinar. And I don't know why that is, but but Peter, maybe he'll turn down his uh, his stuff just a little bit, and then we'll we'll have a better shot at it. So, so is that is that a little bit better, Roger? You're, you're, you're better? perfect so far. So let's uh, okay. let's continue on and let's see where it goes. But everybody, mm -hmm. give us a little bit of a break if it uh, if it does get a little chunky. It probably is going to get better. So the most important thing I have to say really is I. Uh, decided to stop fixing cars. I started working one-on-one -on -one with club level drivers about 15 years ago. Uh, it was my sole job, it has been uh, for the last 15 years. And I hung my hat on the objective measure of what drivers do to try to help uh, people coach themselves. And uh, this equipment, especially AIMSport uh, and AIMSport line build equipment, is pivotal and critical in every driver's uh, performance optimization. And one of the greatest tools in the world is the Smarty Can. And that is no uh, puffery, that is a fact. It is rock solid, it is dependable, it is reliable, it is rugged, and it's, it's one of the best products in the market and the best product for drivers to help coach themselves. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Perfect, and I just so you know, uh, Peter, the, uh, I did ask in the chat box, and uh, and for the last minute or two, everything has been perfect. So, uh, so I, I think we've probably gotten past that a little bit. So, so perfect. The um, uh, one of the first questions that just popped up here is: is there a two camera smarty cam in the works for the U.S. market? I'm not going to put you in the in the spot for that, uh, Peter. But there, you know, it, the answer to that almost always is: uh, the aim is always building, looking at designing, looking into the future. And, um, and I do not know, you know, and not ready to announce that there's a, you know, X is coming, but uh, uh, certainly that is something that is, uh, is, is important to people and, uh, and probably on the table. And you, you know, we're always working on the next, uh, the next smarty cam. So keep, keep that in mind. Uh, maybe when we get some of our friends from Italy on here in, in, in future webinars with uh, maybe we'll ask them that question too. 
Um, David asked the question to, to kind of a setup. We're not going to answer this right away, but I can't get the track to show up on the Smarty Cam video. I know that Peter's going to chat about that specific issue. So David, uh, hang tight. We're going to we're going to get to that in just a moment. Yeah. Okay. And uh, so let's jump into the next slide. And um, and, and Peter, I'm going to um, I think I'll, I'll just retain the ability to, to change the slides just to make sure we get past that until we transfer uh, over to your computer. Uh, let's walk through the slides. You just tell me when you want to, to up, move to the next slide and I'll take care of that for you. Well, that sounds great. Um, you know, the, the most important thing that I can talk to people about is video by itself is very sterile. There's not a great deal of information. There's generally no speed. There's tons of GoPro videos out. Uh, all over and other action cam videos that show nothing um, or just simple metrics such as speed. The concept of intelligent video is information on the background of the video so that you can make decisions on where you want to focus your attention uh, off in the very next session. So intelligent video is basically video with metrics on it, important metrics, many of which we'll talk today. And is applied generally from a connected logger, um, you, from a solo 2DL all the way to uh, uh, an MXG 1.2. So the idea here really is uh, to get video that you can do something about. Why is intelligent video important? Because you need to know the numbers. You need to know the speeds. You need to know the G loadings. You need to know where your right foot is on the throttle or your left foot on the brake. It's super important because it is an accurate record of all that has happened. The problem is that our minds are very powerful things. We remember things the way we would like them to be, not necessarily as they were. This thing is not a tattletale, it's a tool. And, and it's a great tool and it's important because it provides immediate review. And most drivers, <clears throat> you know, even engineers can assimilate information more quickly uh, visually uh, then they can pouring over a bunch of uh, spreadsheets and, and charts and that sort of thing. Now, spreadsheets and charts are important. They can be looked at <clears throat> deeper to validate and to cross-check information, but this allows immediate review. And the, the, uh, the last thing is, uh, if you look at data and strip charts and colored maps and, and histograms and that sort of thing, it's all well and good, but to provide the context that you need to evaluate the validity of the information. Did you run into traffic? Were you on a line that was to put you off the edge of the road? And that's why the throttle cracked at that point. This is the reason why intelligent video is the primary influencer on the data that you're about to review. Typically people will watch the, the fastest lap first. And when they open their data, that will show you an open by default to the fastest lap of the session. So that's important. Finally, the 80-20% rule, we want to set aside the 80% that you're really doing well, uh, that is as you remember doing in the car, and you need to find and focus on the 20% that will really make a difference. Something as simple as car placement, we'll get back to this in a moment, uh, car placement, if the car is out of place uh, and you don't remember it being out of place, that should direct your study for the very next session. And that is one of the reasons why the Smarty Cam is so important. Roger? Yes, yes, sir. The, uh, you, you mentioned something in there. I just wanted to, to, to add just a couple more words to. You, you talked about um, different ways of looking at uh, information, right? Whether it's, uh, whether it's the squiggly line or the spreadsheet or the video or whatever it happens to be. I, I normally don't do this, but uh, the uh, we 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 have videos planned out a ways, right? And and uh, and I and I just looked in the list, and I see that James Colburn is here with us, joining us today. And uh, a week from today, James Colburn is going to work with me and and, and going to co-host, and we're going to talk about learning methods, lear learning styles, and all and 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 talk about whether you look at everybody's different. So you can look at video, you can look at tables, you can look at squiggly lines, you can look at things in different ways. And I, I am really excited about doing that one. And I normally don't talk about ones that are coming up uh, too far in the future, but James Colburn is going to join us a week from today and, and talk about that very thing. And I, I, I'm, I am looking forward to that and I hope, uh, hope the rest of you are as well. And I'm going to join uh, watching that one because that is something near and dear to my heart. And 
and the way James looks at information is uh, yeah. exceptional, and he's made a study of it, and I'm looking forward to Absolute, hearing it. Absolutely. So looking forward to that. Here's your next slide. So again, the 80-20 methodology review, this is what we're trying to do. This is guides uh, your course of study. Uh, this, this, this tells you what to focus on the very next session, because that is the goal. The sort of incremental improvement, uh, this approachable thing, it's, it's, it's extremely, extremely important. So most people will begin by reviewing the quickest lap. So you will start the SmartyCam video, uh, either in Race Studio 3 Analysis Beta or in a simple video player like VLC Player, uh, basically an open source uh, multi-format uh, video player that works very well. You can scrub to the end of the video. And then uh, if you put the proper information on it and specifically, the best lap time, the best lap number of that um, uh, lap and review the quickest lap, which will be what will appear when you open the data file. You wanna make also sure of your car placement. Uh, if a driver has any question about where to place the car and what to do when they get there, uh, then they are going to hesitate, whether they're doing this consciously or subconsciously, it is super, super important. Um, also, review the speed of transitions. This whole idea of uh, quick hands, quick feet, um, slow corners, fast hands, fast corners, slow hands. Look at the speed of transitions. Uh, if you are equipped with throttle bars and brake bars, you can see the relationship between the throttle and the brake, and that is critical and crucial and one of the things that makes good drivers great. Uh, Matt Romanowski is, has always been a big promoter of this, Ross Bentley, the idea of at the end of all of the, uh, of the video review, annotate a printed map with key performance indicators, maximum and minimum speeds, car placement, throttle placement. Uh, you can really make a, a good step forward, some people can, by writing this information down on a map because it shows them where they're gonna focus on and establishes the goal for the next session. Lastly, uh, there is a tremendous amount of information that can be put on the background of the Smarty Cam. Uh, basically, engine health measures, pressures, temperatures, and even other measures, fuel level, battery voltage. So, you know, I have a lot of people who say, well, I don't have a lot of sensors on my car. Well, guess what? If your battery voltage goes below a certain point, that could be useful information in troubleshooting a misfire or a running problem. That information can be placed easily on the background of the Smarty Cam video. We're gonna show you how to do that, but a quick review of the health indicators beginning in the end of the session will tell you if temperatures are going out of range, pressures are going down over the course of time, uh, and, and realistically, without even opening a data file, can tell you right away whether or not there is something grossly uh, out of work. It's, um, uh, Peter, you locked up just for a second there. I'm sure it's going to come back, but I wanted to mention something anyway. Uh, Sean, Sean, and then Robbie, you responded, but uh, he says, I am dying for predictive lap timing to be visible on the overlay. And uh, and it's kind of funny that uh, that is one of the things that we uh, we expect that we're going to uh, we're going to show you here in a, in a in a couple of slides. So uh, thanks, thanks, Sean. Hang tight, like Robbie said. The other thing is, uh, Peter, you are you are coming back. So uh, the uh, the other thing that we will share is Robbie's putting links in there. Uh, some of these slides Peter's going over now are some some of the things, just a few selected items that he covered in his previous um, uh, Smarty Cam webinar. As we kind of scroll up to being uh, to, to some new stuff, and um, and Robbie has put that uh, link to that video in the uh, in the in, in the in, into the chat box and also and it'll be in the description box uh, in the YouTube video for those of you watching this uh, later and also this presentation this presentation will be as a uh, you know zipped up as a PDF file in the description box of, on the YouTube and will be in the in the chat box right now for you so Peter it looks like you're back so uh, let's uh, let's jump to the next slide and uh, and chat a little bit about this one so <clears throat> you know as a driver coach. Uh, if you listen to uh, interviews with pro drivers after qualifying laps, uh, people often talk about hitting their marks, which is placing the car uh, at the innermost point of a large radius or a smaller radius to a particular corner. Uh, are you hitting every apex is, is the number one goal. And 
and no amount of data is is really going to help you with that uh, more and more quickly than intelligent video, which is what we have here. This is turn 5B at Rolling Road. Uh, I'm driving my uh, two-seater sports prototype. Peter's um, freezing. Right base. Uh, every apex and a little, little bit chunky, but it, uh, it, it, yeah, cutting out. Uh, I'm seeing that as well. For some reason, uh, Peter, it is, uh, it's coming in and out a little bit right now. Uh, let me talk about a couple of other things, and maybe we can, uh, while, while yours is kind of freeing itself up. Yeah. Uh, um, Aaron says, I have mine mounted on a motorcycle, and I want to use G-force indicator, but it fluctuates wildly. I manually calibrate it each day while I was on the bike on the stands, but the deviation from the Solo 2 and the DL GoPro are huge. Any suggestions? Uh, if you, you have the, uh, I suppose, do you have the... Uh, it, the the G sensor is in the box, right? It's in the camera or it's in the in the Smarty Cam, the full the, the full all all in one box. And as you lean your bike, it's going to you know it's going to take that lean angle into effect, right? And and um, yeah, so maybe that's uh, maybe that's a bit of a problem. Um, maybe you end up looking at it in the data you know, relative to the camera for uh, for, for I, some of the I, different I, things. So we'll have to see about that one. I, Sounds like you're starting to come out a little bit. Um, might be better to drop his video and just do audio. That might, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, Peter, maybe stop your video for just a little bit. Yeah, that and, sounds uh, fine. Let's see if that, uh, see if that helps. <laughs> no. And um, all right. So yeah. let, let me try this. You're sounding pretty good right now, actually. And you know, your video still yeah. up on my screen, at least. Better. Okay. Uh, that was a, t a tip from my uh, our all of our favorite IT guy, Jeff. Jeff Wasilko. Uh, the, uh, uh, Jeff had a question up there. Maybe Emiliano can handle that in the background. I do not know the answer to that. He talks about uh, suggestions for uh, how to deal with the limit of number of objects. I don't know what that number is off the top of my head, but um, you know, Jeff's been adding and adding and adding channels to his uh, and adding this predictive thing we're going to talk about in just a moment. He ran into a limit and couldn't add any more uh, objects. So we'll. Uh, uh, I, Matt says he believes it's 16. Uh, how's your audio doing now, Peter? Ooh, ooh, we just lost Peter totally. So Peter's going to reboot in. Let's uh, let, let's talk about, uh, Matt says it's 16. And uh, he, he will come back here in just a moment. I'm going to go to the next slide and, uh, and talk just a little bit about where he was going to go next, which is there's been an evolution, right? Uh, and uh, I, I see him jumping back in. Okay, the, uh, that. There you are. I think I think I see you. Do you uh, do you have a yeah. good view of of the screen? So you see, I, I've moved on yeah. to the next slide. Now we're good. So hardware evolution, very simple, straightforward. Smarty Cam has been out for ten years. Uh, the standard definition unit, top left side, then the uh, uh, in twenty. Still, still a little bit notchy. Peter is in a remote site, by the way. It's just so it's uh, it's a little bit harder. We normally have, uh, we've had good internet connection with him in the past. So there's um, a little bit about the hardware connection. I'll let Peter sit there for a second and see if we can uh, we can figure that out a little bit. Uh, hardware connection. Uh, obviously, these things connect with all of our different products, uh, including what Peter wanted to make sure as everybody understood was the, there, there's an ECU or an R RPM bridge uh, connection. And, uh, and and that is such a powerful tool, especially with the, 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 the 2.2 units. Uh, very, very, very important to understand. Okay. The other thing that we wanted to talk about was uh, optimal mounting. This is where the whole, the root of this, uh, this entire thing is going to be going the rest of the today is, it's mounting of the camera. And then, and then, of course, setting up the actual uh, the overlay and making sure that it works for you. Um, one of Peter's tips that he uses a lot is to mount this thing about at eye level, so you as a driver are getting the 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 basic same view that that uh, that you see while you're driving, and and for the video feedback and and playback that you end up with. Uh, uh, that you end up seeing what uh, you know, what is uh, what is valuable to you as a as a driver in the in the data review the video review, so mounting that at eye level and the other thing that uh, can be um, can be uh, valuable is, is especially in the new software and we'll look at this here in a little bit is to get that camera 
as close to the center of the car as possible. If you're in an open wheel car and you have to have it off to the side or a cart, you know, that's one thing. But boy, getting it in the middle and you're, and what we're noticing with the Race Studio 3 beta, when you bring up overlays of multiple laps, boy, having that camera more in the middle and pointing straight down the track allows you to understand the rotation of the car. Did you, did you turn in earlier, turn in later? So having that thing not only mounted in the middle of the car, but also then pointing straight down the track instead of, you know, if, if, if you mount it off to the side and then kind of cock it over just a little bit so you can see the steering wheel and, and some other things. It gives you a little bit of a, an odd uh, feeling as far as uh, what, what it's pointing at. And sometimes you can't pick up that turn in points and things like that as well. So Peter, as soon as you, uh, if you get in there and you actually, your microphone is working, just let me know. I see your, I see your log back in. I think, I think we're pretty good. Uh, okay, there you are. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and jump into the Smarty Cam menu and, and some of the reasons you might want to set some of those things. I appreciate you uh, putting up with this technical challenge. Uh, not to say it won't happen again, but we'll do what we can do. Uh, the most important thing uh, on the camera when you get it at the bottom, that looks like I'm going to lose you again. Uh, but the uh, time zone, uh, DST settings. So this is under menu and then settings. Uh, and you can set the time zone. But the most important thing is. Yeah, we're going to fight that again, aren't we? The uh, uh, yeah, you're, you're coming and going. The, the the point of this slide is that, um, gosh, that uh, that uh, with the new setup of of the Smarty Cam Ray Studio Three and Smarty Cam and all the different firmwares being updated, where the tracks now store the the time zone that they're in. So the, the this wall is it's still important to go in and double check it. The one that's even the most important is the daylight savings time. That is not automated in any way. So getting in there, make sure all that's right. Make sure that you end up with this uh, this setting here being uh, the, the correct setting while you're there. And we do this, this is important to us, and, and Peter's going to has some slides a little bit later that show this, is we also feel that it's pretty important to always put the, the date and the time as one of your overlays onto your Smarty Cam. And that is just super helpful when you grab that video, or maybe you're looking at a video a couple days down the road, and you're looking for, you're looking for Saturday morning's practice or qualifying session. And boy, when you got the date and the time up there, it sure makes you open up the video and you look at it, and it says, 50, you know, uh, you know, 3, 3 p.m. Uh, no, I'm looking for about 10, around 10 in the morning. You can find it really quickly. And having, so having that correct time set is important. Um, sure. Setting it up where it, uh, where it uh, starts and stops appropriately is, uh, is important. It's personalized. Everybody likes it a little bit different. Uh, I know some people want it to start, uh, you know, when the, when the data logger starts gathering data and just have longer videos and, and make sure that it's working for you. Other folks really want it when it's greater than a certain speed or a threshold yeah, as shown there in the middle bottom of, of those slides. So I think I heard you trying to break in, Peter. Are you, are you back a little bit? Stop. Global Rallycross, yeah. uh, Solo, Autocross, Hill Climb, Logger Control is best. Yeah. For circuit use, high performance drivers education, track days, club racing, pro racing, uh, enabled by speed is always a good one. So I think you, you covered it very well there. Okay, perfect. So let's jump, uh, let's ju and then acceler accelerometer calibration. I don't know if you mentioned it while you were breaking up or not, but that is one that uh, somebody's already mentioned a little bit. Uh, the accelerometer the, of that little icon that's on the screen is set by an accelerometer in the camera or in the Smarty Cam. Uh, GP versions in the camera itself, the full all-in-one unit, it's in, the, it's in the box. It's not using the accelerometers from your car, so for your data logger. So make sure you do your accelerometer, depending on how you mount the, the, the system, make sure you uh, calibrate that accelerometer. Yeah. Okay. Nice slide. There you go. Here's why, why you were gone one time. I talked about you were going to mention a little bit about camera placement and the camera views. So let's let's uh, go ahead and describe that a little bit. Well, see if we can talk a little bit about it. I really enjoy uh, placing the icons of these uh, of the display measures in areas that don't get in the way of the view of the track. Uh, I love the carding on the top left hand side. I like the fact that the track database has been loaded onto this uh, Smarty Cam to allow for a overlay of the track and the cars, the cart's position on the track on the top left. Um, I do love uh, day and date on the lower left hand side of the carting exactly, and then we have uh, temperature in the middle. We have the accelerometer on the right hand side, both longitudinal and lateral G, and then we have the timing information on the lower right hand side. 
uh, which indicates not only the current lap and the current lap time, but the best lap and the best lap time. And that's really, really important. That is something that wasn't available on the uh, standard definition camera, but, but since the HDs come out, it's been a great feature. The multi display of the tachometer, gear, speed, brake, and throttle is a real estate saver. What you can do is put a lot of information in a small area and that works really, really well. Now on the right hand top, we have a Jaguar E-Type uh, lightweight replica at Goodwood. Uh, this car didn't have very many sensors at all. So what we did was we put uh, the, the day and date on there. We put the tack, we put uh, speed, and we put uh, the lap time information. We didn't have throttle or brake, uh, not permitted in that, in that venue. Uh, but we have still enough information to look at positive acceleration, uh, look at maximum cornering Gs and make comparisons from corner to corner and lap to lap. And that is really, really important. Um, this it is right about the eye level of the driver. I would like to see it a little bit higher because I want to see the corners of the edges of the front of the car to the edge of the, of the road. That is true for the lower left-hand side. Uh, that is a really, really nice picture. Uh, of, uh, of, of likely a Porsche uh, GT3 Cup uh, headed down out of turn one at Watkins Glen at the exit. The driver fully committed to throttle. We have brake information. We have uh, throttle uh, time, lap time information. We have speed and RPM. Now, why would you want RPM? Because it helps you make better gearing choices uh, for specific speeds in specific corners. And then the bottom right-hand side, uh, my car at, at VIR a couple years ago, I have uh, water temperature, I have steering angle in uh, uh, either percentage or degrees, I don't remember. We have oil pressure, which is important to me to determine how that drops over the course of time as the oil temperature comes up. Uh, and we have throttle and brake, super important. But this, this information is generally out of the way of looking at the driver's head and hands. It is important to see the driver's heads and hand in the cart. It's important to see the driver's feet. So uh, the icon placement is super important and camera placement, at least with the lens at eye level uh, is super important. If you don't want it to block your rear view vision, you can place it off center slightly uh, to the other side of the driver, uh, face it, uh, down about 10 to 15 degrees from horizontal, facing right at the center of the front bumper. But you can see in the top right hand side, Roger pointed this out before, you can see a great view of the rear view mirror. So we have uh, not only where we're going, but who's coming up on us, which is a great way to do it. And we can, uh, when we can put logos and things up there as well, that's always important. Uh, and only one of the three that you have here, uh, one of the four, has the actual track map. I know we're going to talk about that here in just a moment, but uh, also a very valuable, uh, valuable thing. And since it's transparent, we can put that up here where, you know, we can see through it and see some things on the backside. So it's a, it's a little not let, not so critical to have it down out of the way. So when you do put a logo up on the background of a Smarty Cam configuration do so uh, in PNG format because that allows a transparency and, and uh, prevents a white background like the top right hand side I have on mine. Yeah, right up here, right there. The aim is actually a, a PNG, I think. Exactly, the transparent background. It's, it just makes it, it does add a little bit of, uh, it does look a little bit better, I think, when you have that transparency to boot. So, Super. okay, let's go to the next slide. Okay, uh, we, we had that question earlier uh, from, um, gosh, uh, who was that? Sean, I think. Uh, Sean asked about predictive lap timing. And while we do not make it available, uh, Peter's going to talk about this here in just a second. While we do not make it uh, as, as a just a standard graphical overlay, uh, one of our uh, power users, Charlie, has, has, um, has come up with a way, and we wanted to include it in here. Uh, a, a number of people have used it and, uh, and have been very happy with it. So I wanted to uh, include it here. Peter asked me to, to put this in here. And uh, Peter, talk a little bit about it and uh, what, what you know about it. So predictive lap timing display is super important because uh, the way this information will be presented on the background of the screen 
is in milliseconds how far ahead or behind you are of your previous lap. So it's a plus minus test best time. Uh, so there is a math channel that needs to be made in the logger. Um, this is uh, good for any of the current generation of loggers. Um, follow the directions that Charlie lays out. And, uh, and what you're going to do is there was some discussion before about the limitations of the number of channels that are transmitted through the AIM proprietary CAN bus to the camera of 16. And uh, most people don't use all 16. So you pick an unused Smarty CAN function. We'll show that in the configuration uh, that, that is looking for an integer or a number. Uh, in this particular case, you use fuel level. Um, and then you unlock the ability uh, to, to enter that information from another generated channel in the logger by ticking the box, enable all channels for functions in the uh, Smarty Cam stream tab in the configuration. We'll show this in a moment, but this is a really nice step-by-step -step guide in putting in milliseconds how far ahead or behind you are of your previous lap. Now, why is that important? Because it tells you very specifically what is working on track and what is not when you review the video. And that is super important. Kind of a cool cool process that some folks have worked out to work around a, you know, a, a function that we have not made available. So that's a, that's a good idea. Joe mentions in, in the in the Q&A, uh, Joe, a little bit of uh, you know inside baseball behind the scenes, behind the curtain here. Uh, 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 this this slide is not in the PDF that was uh, was linked in the chat box, and uh, but uh, because Peter Peter as we were chatting about it this morning as uh, in the last uh, 20 30 minutes before we started, uh, Peter goes, you know what, we ought to add that. So I added it really quickly. Here it is. You're seeing it, but the the PDF was already sent to the server. Uh, I will be I will be adjusting that. Anybody that wants to re-download this um, this PDF description box in YouTube down below. We'll, we'll have the appropriate uh, slide and with this uh, information to make it a little bit easier for you. A lot of information, there are a lot of steps. So obviously you, you're, you're gonna want that slide. So that'll be up uh, fairly soon, Joe. Uh, as soon as we get done, it'll be up on the YouTube description. Big, big thanks to Charlie for putting this together. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Peter, there you go. There's your next slide. Okay, so configuration best practices. Um, obviously, we are going to configure all Smarty Cam HDs with Ray Studio 3. Uh, we are going to configure older loggers uh, and newer loggers uh, with Ray Studio 2 or Ray Studio 3. Uh, we want to make absolutely sure that the latest configuration software is loaded, uh, and that would be generally Ray Studio 3. Very important, super important. Uh, we want to make sure that the latest firmware is loaded via a USB uh, cable or an SD card from the configuration software. Um, we'll be able to load that, that firmware on uh, to, to the uh, camera specifically. And we obviously want to make sure that the logger channels match uh, the Smarty Cam channels and the icons. And this is something that uh, Roger has been really harping on me uh, for, which is, which is really good because we wanna make sure that uh, brake position and brake pressure, the way it animates the bar graph in the background of the video is in fact what it says it is. And that channel is supplied from the logger. We also wanna make sure and we know that the tracks that are loaded onto the logger uh, the graphical representation of the tracks aren't always loaded onto the camera. And so what we want to do, uh, there is actually additional um, utility and value in the way the maps are managed in Race Studio 3 for the Smarty Cam now. And um, for that reason, you want, if you have any doubt as to how recent the database is, uh, start fresh. So, so you're going to wipe out all the maps, the track maps in your Smarty Cam, and you're going to reload fresh ones from the latest version of the configuration software. Um, super important. Tracks can be loaded by the USB cable or the SD card. Uh, Roger likes to do the SD card. I used to do the SD card. I now use the USB cord. Uh, it'll tell you if it's not going to work, but uh, generally it, it works very well and it's very reliable and dependable. 
There are limitations to uh, SD cards, specifically the life. I really recommend people replace them twice a year if they're doing six, eight, 10 events a year. Uh, even simple um, uh, static electricity can uh, disrupt the orderly transfer of information on an SD card. There are a lot of fake SD cards. So full-size SD cards that are counterfeit, uh, it's super important to buy the best quality SD card you can buy. Um, in terms of formatting, all cards up to 32 gigabytes are uh, formatted in FAT32, which is a very basic, very simple, very bulletproof format. If you wanna run a 64 gig card or a 128 gig card, you can do that. But you will be presented with a menu on the Smarty Cam uh, to format the card before you get ready. It is always, as Robbie just pointed out, always important to carry a spare. Um, you know, I would say that more missed video recordings and missed opportunities to capture flowing brilliance of drivers is due to the fact that somebody doesn't have a card. Um, it is super important that when you pull a card out of the camera, um, put another one in there. Um, Jeff Wasilko, perfect example. Never take a card out with, put, without swapping another card in. Super important. You never know how uh, valuable that, that one video will be, for sure. And you never un overestimate my ability to screw up and for forget to put the card back in, saying, I'll just, I'm going to go out, download it, come right back, and I'm going to put it right back in. And I, uh, more times than not, I forget to put the card in. Life always so. gets in the way. <laughs> exactly. And the other, and, and uh, you mentioned high quality cards and all that. Whenever somebody calls me and, and the rest of the tech guys here at AIM, the, and they say they're having smart econ problems, the first question we ask is, are you using a micro SD in, a, in an adapter card? That, that just does not work. You can get away with it for a while, but uh, it, it, you are going to have trouble. So use a, a, a good, fresh, high quality uh, SD card without an adapter. And the, uh, and the other thing is, is some people will go to the, to the store and they buy the, you know, the, the, the 128 gigabyte card, right? And they're, they can be a, a chunk of money. Uh, boy, I'm going to tell you the way I have handled it uh, is, is not by one 128, but maybe by three 32s and, and be swapping them out all day long. If, if you're, if you're downloading your, you can get an entire day on a 32 card anyway, but if you are pulling that card out all the time, the having multiple 32s is going to be much, much better for you than, uh, than one large high quality. Yeah, Dave, card. David asked about, you know, do you, do you have to, to format cards and, and what I'm, uh, our experience is that the, the camera will format the card Absolutely. if it is needed and you can go through the push button display in order to do that. It, uh, it, it'll automatically do it. When it sees a card that is not formatted with the correct uh, file structure and all that, it just automatically does it. So That is great. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. That's okay, great. let's go to the next one, which is live. This is the one that's made, been making me nervous. If you've been watching, the, uh, if the camera's been on me and you've been watching, you've been seeing me bend over and do a bunch of stuff. I have, uh, in case Peter's uh, uh, thing, in fact, we may not even give it a shot, but maybe we'll just uh, do do everything here locally on mine, Peter. Well, let, let's let's do yours, uh, Roger, and you and I will, will okay. come together. Uh, you and I both made up, uh, actually, you made this uh, target objective list. Mm -hmm. And the first thing we really want to do is uh, we want to create a new Smarty Cam configuration. So let's start by doing that. Okay, and in order to build a configuration, you just click on the configuration button and then and then click on uh, new. I, I've, I, I've got one here that I've created, but let's just do a, do a new one. And, uh, and this happens to be a, a 2.2 that I have here, but if not, to go down to the, down to the bottom, you'll see all, all devices, the last configured ones you'll see on the top. So I'm gonna go ahead and pick a 2.2 and click on okay. I'm just gonna call it, uh, you know, a webinar. And we'll leave that alone. Boom. And there it should all of a sudden pop up. Okay, Peter, so we've got a brand new, fresh, uh, ready to go uh, um, configuration here. How, let, what, uh, what's important to you when, you're, when you are doing these kind of things? So the, the whole thing is I want to be able to see the track. You know, I, I want to make sure I can see the edges of the track. Uh, the nice thing is the background button uh, right at the top, just uh, to the right of center allows me to replicate a different picture. Uh, perhaps background five is something that is 
more familiar to my usual uh, play on the racetrack. I'm chasing this S2000 and this Porsche, and I want to get those guys, and, and I want to see what it's going to look like, very similar. You can also actually uh, take a screenshot. Uh, yeah. Can you not, Roger? You can. It, you can start your live view. I, I, I don't want to take the time to do that, but when you start your live view, then you can hit this snapshot button, and then you get a view out of your car as it's set up right then, and then you build your your uh, configuration right here with the view out of your car once you get the camera set exactly where you want it. Very, very powerful. Very cool. Very cool tool. So let's go ahead and, uh, and put the multi in there. Uh, let's put that on the lower right-hand side so we can keep an idea uh, of what the driver is doing with their head and their hands, and that looks okay. really good. Uh, we definitely need to talk a little bit about the multi-display ranges on the very lower left-hand side. Uh, you know, if you have uh, by default a uh, tack that reads to ten thousand, but the motor blows up above seven thousand, then there's no sense in putting that there. So, so let's click that to eight thousand, which is a a, a better uh, granularity in that tachometer reading. Let's go ahead and go to the uh, speed and uh, we'll, we'll use 150 miles an hour. That looks good. And then brake position, it's very important to understand that brake position is generally a switch, a stoplight switch or some other thing. And so brake position in percentage will generally be displayed in zero to one, not zero to 100 if it is a brake light switch. So you really wanna switch that to uh, zero to one if you are going to uh, have the light just flash on. So a spec E46, so this is a BMW E46 M3, does not get brake pressure, but it gets uh, a brake switch. So on off, and you would just swap that. Uh, you can also, from the takedown, uh, from the drop down menu on brake position, we can change the brake pressure. And uh, you are gonna need to look at some of your log data to see what the highest sustained pressure is. And, and that's the way that you can adjust the total displacement of that brake bar, which is really nice. Now, if you don't have anything, if you don't have brake uh, uh, pressure sensor or light switch, use inline acceleration. And inline acceleration after the accelerometers are calibrated will allow you to get a good, pretty good measure of the decelerated forces that are forcing your body against the shoulder harnesses. So uh, in inline uh, acceleration, very few cars develop three Gs braking. So I'm gonna change that to 1.5. And uh, usually if you do it 1.5, that's maximum braking on flat level ground and you should be in pretty good shape. Now for the next icon, let's change, let's add drag and drop, best lap time, best lap number which is on the right-hand side. And we can put that on the lower, uh, more central section. And that will allow us to, to, to see what's going on. And we can find out what uh, is happening. Uh, we can put the date time digit in the top right-hand side of the screen, which is useful. And we can put uh, the temperature bar, which is uh, uh, just below the day and date and year uh, on the top right. Just put that up there. Now we want uh, we want to we might want to put more than one temperature sensor. So we're going to use a small label, the text, uh, just to the left of the temperature gauge, and we are going to write on that and say WT or H2O. So WT looks good, and now all of a sudden we are in good shape. And I want to add another temp bar, so I'm going to drag the other temp bar over. Uh, below the existing one, and I'm going to select on the lower left-hand side, oil temp, so engine oil temp, there we go, and it automatically adjusts the proper range, and then we get another small label, and we put it to the left of the uh, temperature gauge that we just put in, and we put OT for oil temp, so now all of a sudden you have all of this good information, it works really well. Now, I want the map on there, so Roger, let's do that. Uh, oh, look at you, man. That is awesome. That is really, really cool. So let's put the track map on the top left-hand side. And then let's talk for a moment about logos, because I think people would enjoy adding that information if you can. So, Well, I've got a crazy number of logos there, don't I? Uh, <laughs> the, uh, that is pretty cool. I think Dirtfish yeah. needs 
Oh, that's, that's, that's kind of silly there, isn't it? But uh, the, uh, the, the, the other thing, I, a couple things on track map, if, if we're setting these up. Bigger. If you know, number one, bigger, uh, because it's, again, it's, it's transparent so we can see through it, so it's not the end of the world. The other thing that I find is, uh, is kind of cool is if you know your track layout by looking at it in Ray Studio 3 and you know how the graphic is, if it is an up and down track, if it's longer up and down than it is sideways if you go ahead and make this this size the track is just going to sit here in the middle of it and be up and down right kind of like vir is kind of runs this direction as far as its length uh, so if you have that particular type of track maybe you build you, you right off the bat you start off with it like this and then it ends up over here right sure. uh, other tracks that you may run maybe maybe the track is is oriented in, in, you know, across and maybe it'd be better to be this way. So yeah, try a couple things, get it, get it to be the way that, uh, the way that you like it. Um, there's one more thing, Peter, that you went, you went uh, over that, I, that it is, an, it is the biggest question I get when it comes to these overlays. And, uh, and it was on the, it was on the multi and it was on this brake position that you talked about. Yep. The uh, brake position, brake pressure in, in line. Uh, the default on this is brake position and zero to 100. That works for nobody, right? right. And it's right. the default. So a lot of people put this up there and then within a, you know, a couple of weeks, we get a phone call and it says, you know, hey, I got my brake position and that's what I've got. I've just got a, a, a zero to one and, and it's not coming on. And in reality, it's working. But as Peter mentioned, it's scaled to 100. So this little brake logo here is moving over one one hundredth with the lit area. <laughs> And uh, so, so this default is just the, it's almost the worst of all cases, right? So, uh, so if you're going to go brake position, make sure you do zero to one on the scaling. If you're, if you have a brake pressure sensor, change that. And then the scaling is, is probably not too bad. At least you'll be able to see it, even if you never get to 1450. So that one there is the biggest phone call that I get as far as smarty cam configuration questions is, 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 is. Brake. So just to interject, my experience, Roger, um, I'm going to tell you that a majority of analog sensors like the old PRS 839 and the new zero to 2000 pressures on um, club racing cars and converted street cars, very often the maximum pressure could be as little as 450 to yeah. 600 PSI. Yep. So it is super important. That it, there is no one size that fits all to make that brake bar read fully. And you really need to go out make a run, look at your data, and then come back in and set the calibration for maximum deflection in the bars to make them really useful when you're watching the video. And that is, again, a time saver. Just spending a little time to properly scale these measures are really going to help you a whole lot. And another, uh, and, and, and I think one of the things on my list maybe was when you go in to start live mode, and you're sitting in your car with the laptop with it cabled up to your to, to your smarty camera or with it in live mode. Boy, if you turn on your ECU and, and your and your analog channels and you start pressing the pedal, you're going to see these all these these graphical elements work. Right. Yeah. A yeah. great way to do it back when you're in the workshop and, and make sure everything is working the way that it ought to be before you even go out. You should see the temperatures. You should see the throttle and brake. And, and if you started it up, you'd see the pardon me, you'd see the RPM. So uh, uh, that, that live, that start live view is, is very powerful. Now, now one more thing, you know, before we leave this screen, what I'd like you to do actually is let's get rid of the multi on the bottom right hand side. And let's get rid of the time on the left hand side. Yeah. And let's go into maps and load or go to set and go to dashes. So by far, one of the most popular applications is MX-5, Mustang, Porsche. So multi D3 on the bottom, uh, just up, yep, and drag that up to the lower right-hand side. That is absolutely one of the most popular backgrounds that I see. If you have a new GT3 RS, 10,000 RPM is fine. If you have an older car, 8,000 is plenty. Uh, 100, uh, yep, that sounds good. And then 180 degrees, and that was good. And we're in good shape. And Robbie Yeoman pipes up with good information. Now, let's talk about yeah. maximum lateral longitudinal acceleration. This is something that you and I talked about last night, Roger. Uh, we have three concentric rings in the friction circle on the bottom. Uh, ideally, we should be equidistant from zero all the way out. Most streetcars, really, without the benefit of compression, 
uh, are really not going to be more than 1.5 G sustained. So let's change the maximum lateral longitudinal acceleration to 1.5. Now, what this will do is this will allow actually, if it was one, it would be quicker and move around in a more uh, animated way. By increasing the number to 1.5 from 1.0, each of those concentric rings is one half a G. And also the damping of the ball will be such that you can make some sense out of it. So that is really, really important. And it answers the question we had back a little bit earlier for that one user that was on his motorcycle and it was jumping around a lot. Maybe, maybe we bump, uh, bump, bump these numbers around a little bit. Maybe that. Now I will, I will be honest that my personal experience with the GP version of the camera is that the friction circle display is of the least value from the GP cameras. Now the uh, all in one cameras do not seem to have this issue, but the GP cameras do. And it can be something as simple as stray EMI, a bunch of other stuff that causes it to flake out. Uh, but but that's, that's something that isn't necessarily quite as rock solid dependable with the GP. However, one of the things that the GP does have that is really cool is if you go up to the top left and click use ECU, we can actually connect with the appropriate harness. Let's go down to Porsche. Let's go to 718 GT4 CS. Uh, 718 GT4 CS one up right there. All right. So with the addition of a very simple four pin DT connector, you can plug in, get power ground and car information and have all of this displayed without any logger in the car. And this is really, really nice. You can add to systems uh, such as MoTeC uh, with, with preloaded templates. I recommend uh, the video compound transmit full at one megabytes. That's more information. But here we have all of this information coming right through. Uh, and, can, and as long as there is a channel on the left column, you can put a icon on the background of the video and make that work. Um, so I, I really, really like the fact that, that more and more things. So for years, the old 987.1 and .2 Porsche Caymans uh, didn't have brake information. But these ECU protocols and drivers are constantly upgraded so that you all of a sudden, the first time I saw brake for an early Cayman 2006 to 2009 was in this menu um, for, for another for another car. So actually let's uh, change ECU and we're gonna go uh, to Porsche. Let's try the EMS Siemens on the bottom. Actually, no, let's go to, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll do that and click okay. That's the second series car, 2009 to 2012. But now all of a sudden we have brake pressure on the on the left hand side, and it works. So so this is really really good information. And if you have another data system, or you just want to make a a intelligent video with this information on the background by a simple connection to the car without any other logger, this is the way to do it. And it and, really and, works. And and. We, did you chat about the enable all channels? No, let's go. Button? Let's go. This is good. Talk about what that does for our, for our user. So, so one of the things is that we are locked in. So the channels that are, we, we actually need to go into a logger configuration and let's do that. Let's go into a logger configuration first and explain the two part step. So if we go into the MXG uh, configuration and we select the smarty cam stream, these are the standard Smarty Cam functions on the left that are part of the template. Does that mean that specific information needs to go out? Not necessarily, but by default, the normal channel names are installed. Now, if you have a non-standard channel name, like an analog channel or something, you could select the enable all channels for functions when it says no available channel. So it, it said no available channel before. And so we're sort of, well, I want, uh, I want fuel level because I know I have it. 
So let's go ahead and select enable all channels for functions. Go down to the drop down menu for fuel level, maybe. And if the ECU has an outlet, uh, if the ECU has fuel level, and we can scroll down and take a look and see it might have it on the bottom. There we go, fuel, bang. So now all of a sudden something that you thought was locked out is not in fact locked out. You just need to enable all the channels for the functions. So this is only one part of, this is the send of the information from the logger to the camera. The problem is a lot of people stop here. So now we have to go to the camera. Uh, there we go, beautiful. So we have, this is nice because we have both configurations open in tabs and we can say, okay, now I am looking for, I see that fuel level on the bottom says no available channel. Let's go up to enable all channels for functions and click on that and then go to the drop down menu for fuel level. And I don't remember if this is in yeah. this, but scroll down. I think it is. There it is. Fuel level. Bam. Click OK. Done. So this is how you get these icons that don't work uh, to work. Now, it's not going to work if there's not a generated channel from the logger. Super important to realize that. But this is the way the coupling has to work the sending from the logger and the receiving looked for by the camera. How's that, Roger? Perfect, perfect. We are getting close on time. So if the, is there anything else that you wanted to kind of cover before we uh, we start to jump out? Actually, Roger, I, I, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I'm looking at the sheet and I have been listening to you uh, <laughs> assiduously and it really looks like we are covered most of the things that we wanted to do, That's except for firmware update. That's the last thing. Uh -huh. Wow, perfect. Amazing how a little bit of practice makes us uh, actually kind of hit the, hit on the right points, right? <laughs> the uh, <laughs> there are a couple of questions here. Let's uh, let, let's get those as and then we'll then we'll chat about the uh, the firmware update and then we'll uh, we'll call it a day. Um, the um, uh, Tim mentions and we may may or may not have answers for these uh, uh, for the Delta time workaround. I, I thought it was set versus session best, not previous lap. Um, uh, when we when uh, we use Charlie's tool there, what is it actually comparing against? It's probably the best lap in that session is what I, I believe would, it's would session, be best of session. Yes, that would be my guess, but uh, don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Uh, Joe asks, will you finish the placement of the track map so we can see how to make sure the correct map is shown? Joe, I'm not going to be able to because this was uh, we changed it during the webinar. I do not have here's I have my uh, I. I I set up real quickly a, uh, a smarty cam and I do not have a GPS sensor attached to it. So, uh, so it's not going to be able to give me that. But the, uh, your point being, uh, he, he, you would like to make sure that it's working. You have to be at the track. It has to have that track loaded and, and be in that, per, that relative area of the track. And then all of a sudden the track will just show up in that track map box. If you have it on the automated process, if you have it manually selecting a track, we could do that, but I, I do not have it set up that way and we're, we're nearing the end. So I'm probably not gonna be able to show that. Um, Jeff mentions really frustrated and whenever Jeff's frustrated, it makes me concerned. The, uh, <laughs> that uh, enable all channels for functions limits how you can use the brake position, clutch position channels. It really makes those channels useless for other data. So um, the, I, I think there is some truth to that. And um, uh, ideally it sh I should be able to send any type of channel for all 16 channels. Uh, I, I, I think we agree with that with you and um, maybe we'll, uh, we'll chat with uh, Italy and see what we can fix with that. So, okay. And that's, that's the questions that we had there. I wanted to, let me see if I can open up real quickly the, the Smarty Cam firmware document and share it. So I wanted to, we, we did want to hit that. Uh, let me do a new share. Let me show that document. Peter, you should be seeing that now. I do, it's lovely. The, the, you have a couple of different ways of, of updating your, um, uh, your firmware. Uh, Robbie has already put this document that I'm showing right now in the chat box. will also be in the, uh, in the description box below when you're watching this on YouTube. It, it walks you through the, how to update the SmartyCam firmware. It's a little bit different than every other product we have. That's why we wanted to, to talk about it. And, uh, and there's, there's a couple of ways to do it. Uh, for me, my way is, is almost always is to use this, this second version of, of taking, a, there's a little run file that you can put onto your, um, uh, onto your card, which it talks about a, a little bit earlier in the document. 
have the Smarty Cam off, start it up with, with, by pushing these two buttons and then releasing the middle one when the screen turns, you know, and it's within a half a second of starting it. As soon as it starts to go turn itself on and you see this white screen, let go of the middle one, holding down that right button until you see the little penguin. The, the Linux Penguin. When you see that, let go of the other one, and then it walks itself through the entire uh, process of updating. Uh, make sure you have good battery life in it or it's plugged in. It, all, uh, good tips for you know, always doing firmware stuff. Make sure there's good power. So uh, anything else you'd like to add to the firmware update part, Peter? The only other thing is that I, you know, I, I set up every Smarty Cam before I send it out. And, uh, and obviously, you know, Firmware updates come relatively thick and fast. I actually do my firmware updates uh, through a USB uh, cable uh, with an SD card that is inserted into the camera and uh, it works extremely well and uh, it, it works very well. And that's the second process that's in the document and I just scrolled down to it and then this is the directions for that. So if uh, if, if that, that is what puts the, the SD card, uh, th that little run file onto the SD card as well. Now there are some uh, Ultrabooks and lightweight low power USB ports that do uh, have issues transmitting directly the firmware updates through the USB and configurations as well. That information actually should be uh, uh, the workaround is to get a SD card adapter, transfer the information, track list, configuration, and firmware updates to the SD card, and then doing it the first way in this uh, form. Jeff, that's a good Jeff. Jeff in the chat box just said for for that previous question where we were talking about. Uh, the, the track map, making sure it shows up. If you just drive around your uh, your, your neighborhood and, and create your uh, little fake track around your house, you can be checking those things as well. That's another way if you don't want to put it onto the manual setting to select right. your track. So, okay, I appreciate that. Let me, let me screen share back to the presentation materials and let's kind of start to, uh, to, 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 to kind of wrap this up. I don't see any new questions in the question and answer, so I so I appreciate that. Hopefully, we got to all of the questions that uh, that you had. If you're watching this on YouTube later, that uh, talking about the, the screen capture there right now, uh, all, we we will have uh, all the documents we talked about, and we'll also have the questions and answers that came up that we chatted about in in a document in a few days. We uh, we will attach that as a as a link in the in the description box below as well, in case you didn't hear some of the questions directly. The um, uh, all of this stuff gets up within an hour or so. Uh, this this video will be up on on, on YouTube. Anybody that uh, uh, is watching it here, and I know we went through some stuff pretty quickly. If uh, if you need to go back and review a couple things, please uh, just go check it out there, along with all the rest of them, plus tons of other videos from uh, years past as well that are still very very valid. The um, customer support is is what we do. It's what Peter does. It's you know that's what one of the things we look for in in AIM dealers. Is it's just important to us. Uh, a couple of guys that are normally here uh, helping us are are at the runoffs right now uh, with the with, with the van, and uh, and maybe watching on their phone. I don't know, uh, but they're probably busy, so so maybe not. But uh, uh, customer support. If you have any questions, anything like that, give give me, give Peter. Give us a call at the 800 number out there on the board. Uh, make sure you make sure you let us know. We we realize that uh, you know you, you have a question, uh, you really need it answered, and and uh, let's keep the uh, frustration level low. Give us a holler. Let us help you. Uh, let us help you figure it out. Okay. Next webinar. The uh, to follow this same idea that I mentioned early on is uh, is is is. We're, we're, we're kind of stepping back and, and saying, okay, you're using this, these products and this software. Uh, let's jump back into, instead of some math channels and all that really important stuff that's kind of cool, uh, let's jump back into a few videos in a row where we're, uh, how to use this stuff that you have and how to use it in your daily race weekends. Uh, Matt Romanowski is going to join us on Thursday on the 8th. And uh, what he's going to talk about is You've got some data that you've had from previous events and uh, or you've got some from somebody else to go to a new track. And how would we take that data and video and how do we prep for the for the next upcoming event that we're going to go visit? Uh, Matt's got some pretty cool processes that he follows and, you know, just, uh, you know, top speeds and you know how many shifts and 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 uh, all these different things that maybe will help you how much time do you spend in left hand corners versus right hand corners and maybe you're looking at setting your tires and and, and getting everything kind of set up uh, maybe you start with some used tires you want to put your best tires on the right because it's a generally a left hand left hand direction track something like that right he's going to go through a bunch of different things that uh, those are just probably a couple of bad examples but uh, track event prep and planning 
with your AIM Sports data and video. That's what we're going to talk about on Thursday. Uh, we're going to be focused. Uh, I, I did see one question go by saying we we're being pretty uh, Ray Studio 2 specific today. And uh, and uh, Matt is going to is going to maybe transition and use a lot more Ray Studio 3 beta analysis as, as some of his examples as and, and some Ray Studio 2 stuff as well. So looking forward to, uh, to, to having Matt join us on Thursday and another way of using data uh, outside of the, the right after the, the session, um, you know, uh, uh, data analysis to go faster. So uh, looking forward to that. Just another different way of using data. It's going to be kind of fun. So um, to kind of close this one out, um, Thank you, Peter. Uh, like I mentioned, this is your, I think it's your fifth one. We appreciate all the extra work and all the time. Uh, sorry for the, some of the technical uh, issues it might be on my end, might be on yours, who knows, but it is what it is. And, uh, but we appreciate you being here. And um, uh, there's Peter's contact information. Uh, Peter, is there anything else that you'd like to add as we kind of close this one down? Uh, I think so, Roger. Thank you uh, to everyone for working through uh, my connectivity issues. I am literally at the end of the highway at the Atlantic Ocean. And uh, that's, that's unfortunately where I am. So uh, I don't think uh, you would want to, I don't think you need to apologize for that. I, it's a lovely part of the world, but, <laughs> for, but for technology, maybe a bit of a problem. So go ahead. Well, again, thank you, Roger. I appreciate it. You're, you're very welcome. And, and, uh, and thank you. Thank your wife for allowing us to have you for a few hours and, and all the work that you put in for it. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for coming. Again, uh, look forward to seeing everybody here on, on Thursday. This one will be up on YouTube shortly and uh, rewatch it if you need uh, a few more answers. So thank you very much. Talk to you guys soon.